rolling here again. We were just getting into the fun part of exhaustive elimination or exhaustive calculation. Sorry. Uh, oh, come on, you. There we go. So where we were, what we were just talking about here was the Hoffman elimination. And I said that the initial Hoffman elimination actually occurred with or was discovered using an amine. And, and what I was trying to get at before I was interrupted by my iPad was that if you take an, an amine like this, like isopropylamine, and you treat that with excess iodomethane, what it does is it just methylates the heck out of this thing so that you end up with an ammonium ion like that. Or an, um, yeah, you end up with an ammonium ion like that. So you'd end up with an alkyl ammonium iodide like this. And then this is essentially, you know, something that can be converted into a good leaving group. So I'm going to give you more details starting here. Okay. So what happens is you can take that methyl iodide, um, which is a very, you know, cheap commercially available compound. It's a liquid at room temperature. Uh, you can take methyl iodide and you can convert the amine to a quaternary ammonium ion or quaternary ammonium salt. And that serves as a good leaving group. So this is a good leaving group. Now, the way that you do the elimination is not using potassium t-butoxide. You don't use that. You actually use aqueous silver oxide. So that this is the base that we use. Aqueous silver oxide. So Ag2O in water. And remember that silver only has one oxidation state. So it's not silver one oxide. It's just called silver, silver oxide. Okay, even though it's a transition metal. Uh, so again, here you go. First step, do the exhaustive alkylation with excess iodomethane. And then the next step to do the elimination, you just treat it with silver oxide and water and you heat it up and you always end up with the less substituted alkene, which is the Hoffman product. Now, if you're wondering, well, silver oxide doesn't sound that bulky. Um, why does it give you the less hindered base, okay, or sorry, the less um, the less substituted alkene. There's a good reason for that. First, let me show you a little bit more of the element of the mechanism. When you treat it with the aqueous silver oxide, what it does is it exchanges the iodide ion for a hydroxide, and then the hydroxide just comes in and does an E2 reaction. All right, but we always end up pulling off a proton to make the less substitute, substituted alkene and the rationale is on this slide right here. Remember that when we do an E2 elimination that the leaving group and the proton that's removed have to be anti-periplanar to each other. If you go down the more substituted bond to make the Zaitsev product, okay, so this is the Zaitsev, what you see when you go down this carbon 2-3 bond is that in order to pull off the proton off of carbon two, okay, which is this proton or this carbon right here, in order to rip a proton off of here, you end up with a gauche interaction between the nitrogen with the three methyl groups on it and the R group, the big, well, it looks like a propyl group coming off of there. So you end up with a gauche interaction. Whereas if you look down this bond, you see that when you render the proton anti-periplanar to the leaving group, there's no gauche interaction. And since there's no gauche interaction, it's lower in energy. Now you might be saying, well, Mr. Dion, I thought you told me that, you know, a Zaitsev product is more stable. So even though there's a gauche interaction, yeah, it is more stable. However, if you compare the activation energies for both of these, the activation energy for the Zaitsev, so if I put this in blue, Right, and I don't have time to draw the whole thing, but the activation energy is super high. You make something more stable. And then for the Hoffman, the activation energy isn't nearly as high and you end up with something a little less stable. So that is why we end up with the Hoffman product. It's nothing more than a gauche interaction that isn't present when you make the Hoffman product. That's really all there is to it. So with all that in mind, let's see if we can practice our Hoffman eliminations. It says draw the major product. That's it. That is expected when each of the following compounds is treated with excess methyl iodide, followed by aqueous silver oxide and some heat. So in this one, we also have to practice our our amine nomenclature a little bit. The first one is cyclohexylamine. So I think everybody could draw cyclohexylamine. It's just a cyclohexyl group. And then you have an amine on it. 
you could also call that cyclohexanamine. That would be the systematic way of naming it. So what are we gonna do? We're first gonna treat it with excess iodomethane or methyl iodide. And then we're gonna treat it with aqueous, oops, aqueous silver oxide. And we're gonna heat that up. Just write the word heat. What's that gonna do? Well, first you're gonna do the exhaustive alkylation so that you're gonna end up with this compound. This isn't the answer to the question, but you're gonna end up with this, okay? And you're gonna have the iodide. Then when you treat it with silver, or with a silver oxide, you exchange the iodide for a hydroxide, okay? And then what's gonna happen? Well, there's only one kind of beta proton in this molecule. It's this one here, or you could draw this one either way. Either way is totally fine. And then there's only one possible way you can do the elimination. Oops, where's my beta proton? To rip off, this beta proton, you form the double bond, you lose the leaving group, and your final product is going to be cyclohexene. I don't have a lot of space here, but your final product would be cyclohexene. So just a Hoffman elimination. No regioselectivity to even consider here, but the name of the reaction is the Hoffman elimination when we use aqueous silver oxide. Next one has a chiral center in it. It's um, Tubutanamine, so three methyl tubutanamine. Let's try to draw it out here. So if we have one, two, three, four, we've got a methyl group here, and we've got our amino group here. Okay, so let's move this. Just gonna move it over here. So let's see, if it was on a wedge, then you'd have one, two, three. So you'd be going this way, that's S, so it can't be a wedge, it must be a dash. So let's erase this. And here is our compound. What are we going to do? Now you've got two types of beta protons. You have the red ones and you have the blue one. Could anybody tell me which one is going to be pulled off during the Hoffman elimination? Would it be the red one or the blue one? It's not a trick question. I hate trick Hello? questions. Sorry? Blue? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right, because that's going to give you the Hoffman product. Right, Karen? If you were to pull this one off, then you end up with the Zaitsev product, and that's not it. So let's write down our conditions, just a little bit of practice. Excess iodomethane, and then some aqueous silver oxide. Silver oxide, water, and heat. Yeah, there you go. You're going to make the Hoffman product, and that's it. That's it. That's all, as we say in French. Uh, the next one is NN dimethyl 1 phenyl propane 2 amine. Oh, Jesus. Okay, so let's start with propane 2 amine. So we've got this, and we've got an amine, and then we have NN dimethyl, so NN dimethyl, and then 1 phenyl pro. So then we put a phenyl group over here. Okay, good enough. Uh, so then what we're going to do is we're going to treat it with 1 excess methyl iodide. Step two, silver oxide, throw it in there, some water, and then we heat that. And our Hoffman product is gonna be the double bond that's formed right here, uh, where I'll write my blue proton. If you were to pull off this proton in red, it's, not, it's kind of a funny way of drawing the bond, but I'm running out of space at the bottom of the slide, then you would end up with the Zaitsev product. So our Hoffman product is just going to have one, two, three. Our double bond is going to be here. And there we have it, my friends. That's it. There we go. Did I draw an extra carbon in there? One, two, one, two three, four. One, two, three, four. Oh, yeah, no, that's good. All right. What do you think? Hoffman elimination, not too bad. Oops, dropped my calculator. All right, Hoffman elimination, pretty neat. Uh, let's let me show you a couple more reactions, and then we'll take a short break before we do the Sandmeyer chemistry. I want to show you um, a nitrosonium ion. Remember when we did the nitration? Well, we even did one today. Where was it? Did we not? No, no, we did. We did a nitration. Is it? Thought we did. Mr. Dion's got a great memory. It's just really short. Or was it that we did a nitration? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 right here. 
Okay, I think that everybody here knows the nitration reaction. And you remember the nitronium ion? So when you mix nitric acid and sulfuric acid, you make this thing. So this is called a nitronium, nitronium ion. It's a really powerful electrophile. And remember, we talked about how it undergoes nucleophilic attack like that. You make a sigma complex. Okay, so a nitronium ion. And the reason I'm bringing that up is what I'm going to show you now is called the nitrosonium ion. And sometimes students will confuse the two. A nitrosonium ion looks like this. It's where you have a nitrogen and then you have an oxygen with a positive charge like this. So this is called the nitro sonium ion it's something completely different and that's what we're going to cover now if you've ever wondered about um you know the poisonous compounds in things like uh cold cuts and bacon well i'm going to talk about that right now so nitrosamines which starts right around here reactions of amines with nitrous acid you guys remember nitrous acid this would be a real chestnut from your gen chem days, right? They teach you nitric acid. So HNO3 aqueous, that's nitric acid. And then to make nitrous acid, you have to lose an oxygen. So HNO2 is nitrous, nitrous acid. And nitrous acid itself, I mean, in general chemistry, they don't teach you this. They just tell you like, oh, nitrous acid. Yeah, that's a thing, you know, you just, well, nitrous acid is unstable. It has to be prepared, okay, or generated in situ. That means in a flask. So what you do is to make uh, nitrous acid, you actually combine, um, let me just write a little thing here. You actually combine sodium nitrite, which is an ionic compound with HCl. Okay, you put the two of them together and in situ, they make nitrous acid. It shows you right here how it happens. So this is sodium nitrate, just NaNaNaNO2, a pretty, you know, boring white solid, okay? Then you protonate it with HCl, okay? Then it undergoes a second protonation to make a good leaving group, right? Once you get that oxonium ion, you lose water. And once the water is gone, you end up with the nitrosonium ion. Now, the reason... It's got two resonance contributors, but you notice that when I drew it on the previous slide, this is the one I drew. Can anybody tell me why this would be the major contributor to the resonance hybrid? The one I have in the blue circle, this would go back to, you know, organic one maybe, but there's a reason why the one in blue would be the major contributor. You could draw either one. I don't care, you know, if you're practicing the mechanism. It's because, because oxygen can hold the positive charge better. No, because oxygen is more electronegative. The reason why, Karen, it's it's based on the octet rule, right? If you look at the nitrogen and the oxygen in the one in the blue oval or whatever, you see how the nitrogen and the oxygen, they both have a full octet, right? If you count on the nitrogen, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and the same thing for the oxygen. And there's there's no problem with this one. But in this one, it's not as um, abundant or not as, I shouldn't say abundant, it's not as great a contributor is because the nitrogen is only surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six. The oxygen has an octet. So your rationale, I see what you're saying, you know, like, well, maybe oxygen's better at the, holding the positive charge. It's got to do with the octet rule. Does that make sense now that I show you to everybody? I don't know if I have any questions about that in the homework. I can't remember. I made it a while ago. But um, yeah, yeah, just a little something to think about. Maybe, you know, that's the kind of thing that might show up on a, on a standardized exam if they ever ask you about resonance structures or something. Anyhow, so once you make that nitrosonium ion, so here's our nitrosonium, you can imagine it's super electrophilic, right? You've got a positive charge shown right here and a positive charge right here. So you can imagine that a nucleophile is just like ready to kind of, Yellow, you know, it's ready to react with that thing like crazy. Of course, you'd have to do this. But anyhow, that's the idea, is that it's super reactive. So when you put it in the presence of an amine, here's what can happen. Now, let's get this straight. When you react 
an amine with nitrous acid, right? HNO2, HNO2, which comes from NaNO2 and HCl mixed together, there's two possibilities. If you react it with a secondary amine, it reacts differently than if you react it with a primary amine. Okay, primary amine gives you one thing, and a secondary amine gives you something else. So we're starting with the secondary amine, right? This is a secondary amine. We treat it with nitrous acid, and you get this thing. This is a new functional group for you. It's called an N nitrosamine, okay? Here's the initial nitrogen from your amine, and now it's got this thing dangling off of it, a nitrosamine. The mechanism, I'm not going to ask you that on a quiz. Okay, will, I'll put, will not ask on quiz. I mean, I think in the homework, it would be reasonable. You know, you can use whatever you want to solve the homework. Uh, but here's the mechanism, okay? So you form the nitrosonium ion, and then the nitrogen on your secondary amine acts as a nucleophile, good enough. And then you have water in there because you did it in aqueous HCl, and that can do a deprotonation, all right? And you might be wondering about this first step. I, I wasn't even gonna tell you about this, but you might be wondering about this first step, like, what the heck, man? I thought the equilibrium was lying to this side. Well, yeah, but it, even if it's only lying a little bit to the side of the nitrosonium, as soon as you make the nitrosonium, it's so electrophilic that the amine will react with it, and that's going to lower the concentration of the nitrosonium, which is going to push the equilibrium in this direction. So that's why you, it, this works. You know, this is why this is effective. Now, you might be wondering, what can I do with an N-nitrosamine? Well, the answer is not too darn much, okay? In fact, N-nitrosamines are known to be cancer-causing. They're potent carcinogens. These are the kinds of things that you hear about in, like, you know, bologna and hot dogs and things like that. If you look at uh, N-nitroso dimethylamine, this compound here, you can see it's found in all kinds of places, even beer, okay? Um, and it's not good for you because it is a carcinogen. It's found in, you know, cured meats and things like that. Uh, if you like bacon and you like to fry bacon, you might, you know, consume this compound probably in very small amounts, so don't worry about it. But um, that's why we don't want to eat, you know, an abundance of bacon because it does contain... And then nitrosamine, so N -ni nitrosoperolidine. And then this one here, I mean, if you've ever looked at the structure of nicotine, which is essentially what I have in the yellow circle here, well, um, N, -nitros N nitroso nor nicotine is found in tobacco smoke. So these are all potent carcinogens, very dangerous compounds. And that's why we want to limit our intake of the kind of foods that are shown to contain these types of compounds. And that's really all our book says about n nitrosamines So you might be thinking, why are you, why are we going over this? I mean, this doesn't seem very useful, making a carcinogen. Well, hold the phone, because remember, I told you, if you react with a, with a primary amine, you get something else. Well, check this out. You can do some really useful chemistry. When you take a primary amine, you react it with nitrous acid, you make a new functional group, and this is very important. I'll put a, that was supposed to be something. I'll put a star by this. Okay, this is called the diazonium salt. Very, very important that you know a diazonium salt. And this process, I'm going to use the word a whole bunch of times, it's called diazotization. So again, let's review. Primary amine only. Nitrous acid that's made in situ from sodium nitrate and HCl, and you end up with this diazonium salt. And the diazonium salt, it's not so useful if R is alkyl, but if R is aryl, it's super useful. Let me show you the mechanism. It's really nothing more than a nucleophilic attack followed by the whole crap load of proton transfers, pardon my language. You have the nitrosodium ion, you have the nucleophilic attack, then you have one, two, three proton transfers, and all you're trying to do is get rid of water. Once you end up losing water, you end up with the diazonium ion, okay? Now, um, alkyl diazonium ions, so if you have R, um, and there's a couple of ways we write it. You can put it like this, like this, that's a diazonium ion. Um, you can also write it like this, Rn2 plus Cl minus. 
And sometimes I'm just going to leave out the chloride and I'll just write RN2 plus. They all mean the exact same thing. They're just diazonium ions. And if you have an alkyl group, those are actually super unstable because they liberate nitrogen really quickly. And then it just gives you a whole holy host of products because you have a carbocation. It's susceptible to nucleophilic attack, elimination, rearrangement. So really un, un, not useful. And also it's explosive because the loss of nitrogen is just, you know, so exothermic that it's an explosion. So that's not really useful. But when we come back from our break, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about if you have an aryl diazonium ion. So if you have a diazonium ion attached to an aromatic ring, this is essentially aryl N2 plus, then we have a whole host of reactions we can do where we can put functionality or different groups on our aromatic ring. It's not electrophilic aromatic substitution. It's something different, but very, very useful chemistry. So that's what we're going to take a look at after the break. And we're going to discuss some named reactions called the Sandmeyer reactions, but we'll save that for after our break.